Sorry, we go from our next speaker, Tahu Kukupai. Uh, Tahu specializes in Maori and indigenous population research and leads the Nupia research program, which may not be the subject of what you're talking about here, but the, the actual title, Maori Data, um, Sovereignty, Directions and Challenges. Um, and welcome to your presentation. Um, thanks everyone. Just a quick introduction uh, by way of saying who I am. I work at Zilk. University of Waikato, I'm a social scientist, um, mainly in sociology and also population research. So I mainly focus on Māori and Indigenous demography, uh, but also official statistics, census methodologies, which has been a hot topic of late, if you can remember the interesting process around the 2018 census. Um, and more recently, uh, the subject of data sovereignty, and uh, more specifically Māori and Indigenous data sovereignty. Um, I don't, haven't had much to do with the NZAS as, as an organisation, um, but no doubt you're a very heterogeneous bunch of uh, scientists. Do you lots of interesting and diverse things in terms of your professional practice and the research activities that you're engaged with. Uh, but one thing I'm pretty certain, um, and also kind of confirmed by the previous two speakers, which were really great, uh, is that data will underpin your work, no matter what work you do, that data will be absolutely critical to the activities that you do. So hopefully this talk will have some relevance for you in your own context. Um, but more broadly, uh, data is really important in the New Zealand science context as well. Um, there's a lot of rapid developments going on. The uh, Statue New Zealand Integrated Data Infrastructure is uh, linking up data from across the whole of government into a really powerful research database. Um, there's the wellbeing of budget, of course, which will be announced uh, imminently. And most of the activities around that uh, will be heavily reliant on uh, the use of data to inform not only um, the kind of conceptualization and measurement of well-being, but how that progresses over time and the kind of policy interventions um, that will inform that as well. And um, uh, so there's, there's a whole bunch of data activities going on. Also the New Zealand uh, Data Futures or the Data Futures Partnership um, has written papers about New Zealand, you know, want to have this kind of ambition for New Zealand to be a world leader in the trusted use of shared data. Um, so that's, that's a pretty grand claim, um, but because we have a single political jurisdiction and can be quite nimble with the linking up of data, and we have a relatively small population, we're the one of the kind of highest innovation uh, countries in terms of digitalisation, um, it's, uh, it's not an outrageous claim, but there is a lot of work that needs to be done in order to meet that, and part of that is really around our kind of thinking, not just about the technology, but actually the tikanga, or the ethical framework and approaches that we build into the technology to make sure that it is trusted, that it is transparent, that we are reducing harm, and that we are increasing value and benefit collectively. So, uh, bearing in mind the previous speaker who had the cartoon about talking past each other, I thought it would be a little fruitless launching into a talk about data sovereignty without sort of defining the terms first. So, um, if any of you are computer scientists, you might be familiar with the language of data sovereignty, but uh, used in a mainstream context, it's really around this idea of jurisdiction, and you might recall that there was a big uh, a kind of a, a altercation between Google and the Chinese government some years ago around this issue of jurisdiction, uh, and basically where the data is stored, that, uh, that, that data is subject to the regulatory framework uh, in the country in which it's housed, right? So that's the kind of jurisdictional um, understanding of data sovereignty. Uh, the, uh, the understanding of indigenous data sovereignty sort of inverses that relationship um, and it's really about the laws that data, indigenous data, are subject to the laws um, from the nation from which the data are collected, including tribal nations. So it reframes that relationship between the data and the kind of the locus, the legitimate locus of control, if you like. Now, Māori data sovereignty borrows from that, but in a more kind of specific way, it's really about, in kind of lay terms, is about the inherent rights and interests that Māori have in relation to the collection, ownership, 
and application of Māori data. And I know the question now is, and we get it all the time, what's Māori data? Okay, so don't worry, I've got a slide about that, I've already preempted that. But just to give you um, a sort of idea about the international context, this is not just sort of a one-off kind of boutique concern, but actually there's been an emergence of indigenous uh, data sovereignty networks um, internationally, largely led by, um, but not exclusively by academics. So here in uh, Aotearoa, we have Te Mana Rarana, which you may have heard of, which is the Māori Data Sovereignty Network, been around for about three years, <laughs> largely led by um, academics and institutions, but also um, ICT practitioners. There's a quite large Māori ICT network and digital network. Uh, the United States Network, which is run out of the Native Nations Institute, which has a basis in the Harvard Project of uh, Indigenous Governance. There's the Australian one, uh, which is led out of the University of Tasmania. And there's also emerging networks in places that you might not expect. Um, in Sweden and Norway, if you're familiar with that context, um, they're, they're among the European countries which prohibit the collection of ethnic and racial data. And so it's quite difficult to have a conversation there about indigenous data sovereignty when the state refuses to uh, collect any data that has explicit indigenous identifiers in it. Um, but of course, there's lots of other data that are, um, that are collected and they inform decisions which do impact disproportionately on different population groups, even in the absence of explicit identifiers. And there's a lot of evidence of this in different parts of Europe and uh, of course Germany is a classic case where they don't uh, collect ethnicity data, but they use other sorts of classifications to create a, pers a persons with a migration background. Uh, group and they are uh, kind of a target population of kind of government policies and so forth. So, um, so just to kind of give you a sense in the, that, that, that it's having in kind of an increasing reach, but it means and it's but it's being um, operationalised quite differently in different sort of political contexts. But the one that I, I know the best and want to speak about today is actually what's going on here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So uh, this is a group to Manaarana, which um, I'm involved in. So I kind of have two hats. One is Professor of Demography, crunching the data. And the other hat is, uh, as part of this advocacy group, is actually not just about how you use the data, but asking all those kind of deeper, but more high-level questions about, well, who makes decisions about what kind of data are collected? Um, what are the governing sort of principles and frameworks for how that data are used? And what are the lines of kind of accountability back to the people and the communities from whom the data came to ensure that we're not increasing any harm to them, but also providing some benefits and value. So this is a, an informal advocacy group, completely unpaid, lots of 2 a.m. in the morning sort of emails and stuff like that that we're all familiar with. Um, and Tamana Rarona has a, a pretty specific set of uh, goals. One is to advocate for data rights and interests, uh, data governance, which is becoming increasingly important, uh, storage and security, and data access and control. Uh, there's a website there, there's a whole lot of stuff on there if you're interested and want to go and, and check it out. Um, and also social media if you, if you want to tweet about it. Um, so just returning to that question of, so, so what are Māori data? Is it just stuff about kind of wahi tapu or te reo Māori? Um, and the answer is no, it's not just data about kind of obviously cultural stuff. Uh, Māori data refers to information or knowledge uh, that is in a digital format or that is digitizable about Māori peoples, our environments, uh, regardless of who controls it. So it doesn't have to be cultural data that's controlled by a tribe for it to be Māori data. It's a much broader uh, definition than that. So it can be data, um, and I also data or data, I'm not sure. I spend a lot of time in America, so <laughs> I, 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 can't, I don't have that analogy. Um, so data, it can be data from Māori that is self-generated. Um, Arama is my colleague who's speaking after me, um, and I have worked with a lot of tribal authorities. Uh, so they have their own uh, tribal registers uh, and their own set of kind of transactional and service data and so forth. That's controlled by them, so that's part of Māori data. Um, it's also generated by others. We have a lot of conversations, particularly with Stats New Zealand, as they're the official steward of the whole official statistics system. They have a massive resource of data, Probably 90% of data about Māori, according to this definition, is not actually controlled by Māori. So it's not like you have the luxury of only focusing on your little corner of the world where the data is controlled by you, because most of the data is actually sitting elsewhere controlled by others. Um, and also uh, data about Māori resources, so of course water, land, um, 
uh, are all part of the, the Māori data ecosystem, if you like. Um, so having kind of defined some of those terminologies, um, one of the things that we've been involved in, in recently is trying to set out some, and this is through my work with Te Mana Rāranga, the network, is trying to set out some of the high-level principles that might give some greater clarity to what uh, Māori data sovereignty actually looks like. Um, it's difficult because, in a sense, because data kind of permeates so many different domains, and particularly when you're talking about Māori data in a very broad sense, you can't anticipate each and every possible application of data sovereignty. Um, and some data will be kind of in need of greater protection, and, and other data, I mean, I'm kind of doing a continuum here, kind of closed data, and other data um, might be more broadly shared or even be considered appropriate for open data. So there's a whole kind of spectrum and there's no real cookie cutter sort of solution um, to what this might look like. So one of the starting points that we've engaged in is kind of looking at what are some of the high level principles that might define Māori data sovereignty and then how might, and it's kind of the work of others to think about well, how that might be operationalised into their own context depending on what they're working with. Um, one of the key things here, I think, is that um, there's a really key understanding that the ethical use of data is not just an end in and of itself, but that data is there actually to advance the well-being of the people. And in the case of Te Mana Rauranga, it's about advancing the well-being of uh, Māori, uh, Māori language and Māori culture. So it's very explicit in terms of the kind of principled basis or foundation from which we're working. So I don't want to talk about all of the principles, it's the documents actually up on the TMR website that's had quite wide circulation, but I just want to talk briefly about three of the principles that are on there, um, so it's kind of give you an idea about how we're thinking about this. Now one of the, the principles here um, around Tanga Tiratanga or authority is really about control, and that came out of a conversation with uh, one of our friends who's an uh, international expert in uh, data security. Um, and another friend who's a cryptographer, and they said, you know, it's all well and good to talk about rights and interests at a political level, but when you get down to it, it's really a conversation about control. And what are the mechanisms of control? Um, one is the law, so it's a regulatory environment, but we already know if you're involved in kind of this, the, the, the kind of data field, as it were, that the regulatory environments around data are actually quite weak, because the data technology and the systems have been evolving really quickly, and the law is being very slow to catch up. So you've got the GDPR and the EU, which you might be familiar with, um, which has kind of um, uh, tried to kind of catch up some of that vacuum in terms of personal data privacy and protection. Uh, and in New Zealand, we've had the New Privacy Act. But by and large, there's not a lot of kind of legislative um, protection around the safe and ethical use of data. So uh, one of the uh, principles that we've been focusing on, well then how, what is the option there for, for control and how do you kind of exert that control? Now the second one is around um, jurisdiction and the third one, which I think is most important, is around kind of self-determination. Because at the moment, all of the data is sort of stored in different places and there's a high degree of dependency, you see this particularly with tribes, they're absolutely dependent on Stats New Zealand to collect high quality data about them in the census, because the census is the only um, nationally representative data collection where you can actually get tribal data. Um, and even tribes that have entered into a settlement, they just simply do not have the resources to go out and collect their own tribal census. And in a country where 88% of the Māori population lives in urban areas, um, and a tribe like Whakakohia, 90% of their members actually live outside of their tribal rohe, it doesn't make any sense for a whole bunch of tribes to be, um, to be engaging and resourcing their own data collection activity. So it's absolutely important that the state does this um, in a robust way. Um, the second one around here is our obligations, and the one that I want to kind of point out here is this idea of the collective and the individuals. I was at a conference last week, the INGSA, Juliet was there, Jennifer Curtin, who spoke earlier, the International Network of Government Science Advisors, and talked about this concept of data sovereignty. And most of the people there had no idea about indigeneity, probably didn't really care about the indigenous context. Um, but what they did get was that uh, a lot of the risks and uncertainties, the earlier speaker spoke about the known knowns, the known unknowns, 
and actually in the context of digital transformations, it's the unknown unknowns that's actually the critical point. And most people really didn't understand kind of the indigenous arguments necessarily, but what they did understand is that we needed to move away from an approach which is singularly focused on individual rights and control and need to move into a space where we can think more transformatively about collective rights. For example, what does collective consent look like in the context of linked and secondary use of data? What does, sec what does group privacy look like in the context of algorithm for the using uh, data from multiple sources and using that to um, target credit cards or um, you know, precision treatment or diagnostic. You know, there's a whole set of contexts now which where different digital technologies are drawing from massive data sets and um, the way in which they're being analysed and the decisions that rest on those disproportionately impact subgroups rather than individuals per se. And most individuals may have no idea whatsoever that they've been allocated or classified into those subgroups and yet are being impacted by those decisions. So um, this kind of the tensions there between the rights of the individual but also the kind of rights and interests of groups haven't been that well articulated but seem to be a kind of a fruitful line for scientific inquiry in the future. And the third one is around this idea of kaitiaki <coughs> or guardianship. Um, and the two uh, areas of particular interest is, uh, particularly again in the Aotearoa context, are what are the tikanga? What are the principles and the processes and the frameworks that we need to integrate alongside our technology to make sure that in the context of the science system that what we're doing is actually reducing harm and increasing benefit? Do we have the tools that we need to actually make these decisions now or do we need to start thinking differently about that? Um, and the second one here is on the kind of rush for open data. Uh, one of the earlier slides I had the um, Indigenous Data Sovereignty Group that's associated with the Research Data Alliance. Now the RDA, which some of you may or may not be familiar with, is a very powerful kind of international network that's funded by NSF, uh, European Union and the Australian Government for Innovation. And their whole mission is to enhance uh, the open use of data. So, and it looks a little bit odd, why would Indigenous Data Sovereignty Group be associated with the RDA? Because it's actually in those spaces where you need to have those difficult conversations about what data should be open and what should the protections be around it. Um, there's a, a bunch of, um, but not enough, examples of best practice about what data sovereignty looks like in different uh, contexts. One of those is in Canada in the First Nations Principles of OCAP, which are, uh, OCAP, which are trademarked now, um, and it's really came out of a relationship with Health Canada about how First Nations data should be used in terms of their ownership, control, um, access and protection. And uh, also a, a, a clinical setting, um, and that's described in a, in a paper that we published last year in The Lancet. Um, here in Aotearoa, it's been interesting, the sort of, um, I, I guess, response that there's been, at least in the government sector, uh, to data sovereignty. The chief data steward, who's also the government statistician, has recognised that actually a lot of the innovations that they're driving out of Stats New Zealand require a very strong ethical framework around it in order for that data to be trusted and to be used in a safe way. So she's agreed to a treaty-based uh, co-design Māori data governance approach across the whole of uh, government data systems, which is actually a really different way of doing business. Uh, it's hard to know how that's going to work out, but it's good that someone who has that kind of level of oversight over those data resources sees that as useful and valuable. Um, there's also a conversation going on with the uh, UN Special Rapporteur on the right to privacy, particularly around this notion of group privacy, because internationally there doesn't seem to be any regulatory framework that protects for group rights or group privacy. It's all focused on very heavily on individuals, and he sees the opportunity to start thinking differently in the context of big open and shared data. And the third one is around the Open Data Charter. Um, so there's a whole kind of international movement around the open kind of data movement, and they have a charter, and, and now they're interested in incorporating uh, kind of indigenous data sovereignty principles into that. Um, just quickly, there's a few challenges, there's a whole bunch of challenges actually, which I think are not just relevant to Māori data sovereignty, they're actually relevant to anyone working in the science sector, in the research sector, who's interested in kind of the science policy interface. Um, 
just because of the work that you're doing. I think one of the, one of the challenges is that the priorities and the values, particularly in the context of the commercialization of data, um, that are shaping the rapid evolution of these data ecosystems, um, really, very rarely do they reflect the kind of principles that we've set out um, in the ones that I just described earlier. Um, although there are some small positive developments, for the main part, it's, it's really driven by a whole set of motivations that often have nothing to do with the safe uh, use of data, uh, in a particular commercial context. Um, there's a great deal of uncertainty over the impacts of digitalization on human well-being. Uh, in the session, the INSA um, conference last week in Japan, there was a whole session um, based on the impacts of digitalization on human well-being. And they had the guy from the OECD that's kind of an expert in the science of measurement, if you like, with the Living Standards Framework, and the OECD uh, approach to measuring well-being. Um, and some of the uh, core data coming out of that is that, well, we, what we need to do is we need to measure and monitor now, proactively, the impacts of digitalization on human well-being. And I think, yes, from a science perspective, from an evidence perspective, of course we need to do that, but that's sort of necessary but not sufficient. What we really need to be doing is building institutional um, capability um, so that to kind of make sure that our ind you know, individuals, that our communities, that our organisations, that civil society is better equipped to be able to respond to the unknown unknowns, to reduce harm and to increase benefit. And that, I think, would be more fruitful than simply engaging in more measurement activities. Um, there's still very much a fixation on personal data protection. Um, and in the, in the context that we're moving to where direct and explicit consent for the primary use of data is being replaced by implicit or no consent in the secondary use of data, continuing to focus on an individual um, sort of approach is probably not going to take us very far. Um, and the last one is this kind of regulatory environment, um, particularly when actually it's the corporate players, um, Google, Microsoft. Facebook and so forth, whose very business is dependent on data. A lot of the health diagnostics and health services companies um, are kind of more powerful in the space than government. Um, so that, that um, poses a really tremendous challenge, which we as researchers, I think, need to figure out how we grapple with that. So um, I'm going to leave it there because it was a very big down though, but I kind of wanted to, I wanted to kind of traverse the, the, the important points of data sovereignty. And um, hopefully we've got some time um, for some questions, or at least one. Thank you. <laughs> we do have time for one question. And lunch is not that far off, so... I know, people are looking a little hungry. <laughs> no, no, but we certainly have a question now. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I just would like to get your thanks for a minute for the you know, very interesting address. Though. I'd like to get your opinion on what I see as a current tension in getting data on Maori health. Mm. Because as an individual researcher, we are required to consider Maori, you know, when we do work on a health a disease or health problem. Sure. So we get the data and then yeah. we like publish it. Yeah. And that seems to be a tension between yeah. the sovereignty. Yeah, that's a, and I think you've picked a really great domain because a lot of these issues have been crystallised um, in the area of health data. Um, and so we've been having some uh, conversations with people in the Ministry of Health and other people involved in that about how can you... So this is where data governance um, becomes really important because it's not always possible or even desirable um, for that data to be repatriated back in a sort of narrow ownership sort of lens. But what's probably more productive, both to get the value out of the science and the data, but ensure that it's been used appropriately and in a way that satisfy, satisfies both the groups and the individuals and the groups involved, is to have a robust kind of data governance mechanism there, which is guided by really transparent and explicit principles. Um, at the moment, so you've kind of got some ad hoc things that are already sort of set up, but they're very often the principles aren't particularly well thought out, based on sort of some sort of rigorous approach, or even very transparent. So while we've kind of got the skeleton of what could be really robust data governance, it's, there's a long way to go. And um, uh, health data is a, would be a really good initial place for that to be 
better articulated and resourced and invested in here. And it's certainly in the context of Canada and the OCAP principles uh, with First Nations, that's all about the health data. So we already have some good international best practice examples of what, about what, how that might, what that might look like in detail, kind of in pretty granular detail, um, with respect to health data. So I think it is a nut that can be cracked. Where it becomes, becomes really difficult is when it's the commercialisation of health data. And the FNIGC, which is the First Nations governance group around this, they've been involved in um, some pretty, uh, from what I understand, major court cases with health insurance companies around the inappropriate use of First Nations data. So, it's, you know, the low-hanging fruit is probably the relationship with the government, and, and, but then the, how you then translate that into a private sector commercial environment is a, is a lot harder nut to crack, I think. Yeah. And I haven't got answers really for that at the moment. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sahu. I'll chop this thing. <laughs>